been here for a while, or if, if this is your first time here, we're in the middle of a series, uh, and we're following some of the metaphors in the Bible about how building muscles can be a little bit like building faith. So the so first week we said building muscles, you need strong ligaments and tendons, and to build faith, you need good connections with people like this and uh, with an appreciation of God's creation. To build stronger muscles, eventually, you just got to get off the couch. You, you can't do it from the couch. Uh, even if you have plenty of good excuses like Halloween candy, which many of us have laying around, or the, the kids' choir chocolate stuff that I have two buckets of cookie dough I'm supposed to eat, and I'm trying to get healthy. It's not going to happen. Um, but to build a stronger faith, you also need to get off a spiritual couch. And there are plenty of good excuses, like church is weird. Even a good church can be weird sometimes and with awkward people sometimes and weird pastors and things uh, to build. But you've got to get off the couch if you're going to grow spiritually. To build stronger muscles, you have to have control of your most powerful muscles, especially when things get hard. And to build a stronger faith, you have to have control of your most powerful muscle, uh, which is the tongue, especially when you get angry. To build stronger muscles, you probably need a spotter to be able to, uh, to, to push you and, and help you through the difficult workouts and to build a stronger faith. You need God as a spotter. Whatever baggage that word has, you need to trust that there's a supreme power being whatever it is on your side in this universe. Now, next week, we'll finally get to the heart muscle. But this week, uh, we get to the biggest muscle in the body. What's the biggest muscle in the body? It's not, no, no, no brains. Go a few feet south. The butt. The butt. Yeah, it's, and now Alicia knows why I said Yeah, uh, Yeah, we're going to talk about butts today, which is really difficult for Daniel to pick out music. Um, <laughs> we agreed no Sir Mix-a-Lot, um, but I was a little worried that his prelude was going to be Queen. And, and some of you don't know Queen, so you're okay, but some of you just realized right away what song I was thinking of, and you think, man, this visitors are over here thinking the pastor really is a weird guy. Um, The Bible actually has a few stories, regular stories, just about glutes, uh, and and those are great stories for teaching middle school boys, because it really gets their attention, but the Bible has a lot of stories that uses the conjunction, but. That's actually one of the regular ways that God talks to us, is God says, you know what the world says and does and acts like, but I tell you something very different. You know what you want to do in your life, but I tell you, I have a plan. I have a purpose for your life that's better. You know what people say about God and and church and and Jesus and Bible and faith, but I'm here to tell you there's a better life in there somewhere. Let me show it to you. In in a book called Amos, a few hundred years before uh, Jesus was around, God tells us, I'm going to paraphrase, but you think worship is all about songs and prayers and piety? You think faith is about getting all the religious stuff right? No. God says, but what I really want is when justice flows down like a mountain stream. I want righteousness to pour down like a river that will not stop. Or uh, preview for next week's passage uh, in Romans, Paul tells us, no one ever sacrifices for a regular person. It just doesn't happen. Maybe if there's a really good cause and a courageous, honorable person, maybe they'll give their life. But otherwise, it just doesn't happen. But God puts God's life on the line for you. That's how much God loves us. So the Bible is full of these powerful but statements. And the most famous ones happen all at once, squeezed all together in Matthew chapter 5, near the beginning of what people call the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus starts with the passage that Wes read, where each line, it's a poetic way to say, you, you think that the depressed people are forgotten by God, but I tell you they are blessed by God. You think the way the world works is if you are poor or full of grief or hungry or in the midst of conflict, it must mean that God is punishing you. You ever hear that? Jesus says, but I tell you, God is reaching out to those folks most of all. You might think that faith should be easy, but I tell you, it takes work to stand away from the crowd and to build at least a good, strong faith. Nine statements in a row, uh, right off the bat, Jesus challenges his crowd. You think life is like this, but I'm here to tell you it's something better. And then pretty soon, he gets right into the very distinct uh, but statements. Now, Wes is going to read two of them, and then we're going to sing one verse, the first verse from hymn 347, to let that kind of sink into us, and then I'll ramble on for a little bit, 
uh, and then we'll just keep doing that. A couple of verses and then some singing and then some rambling. Don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. I hear this all the time. What is the point of the Old Testament? Some of you have asked me the same thing. Why can't we just follow Jesus and leave that uh, about there? Isn't the Old Testament about a vengeful, angry God? New Testament's about the nice, happy, graceful God? Apparently not. Apparently, Jesus thinks there's something in that first half, something, uh, a spirit in the law that has come alive in him. Now, uh, he'll be the first one in line to tell religious people when they are misusing and abusing and confusing God's word. It's one of the most consistent things that we read in the biographies of Jesus. But that doesn't mean he's throwing away all of what God had told us before. It doesn't mean he's pushing it away from us. Um, in fact, he's asking us to hear God in new ways. And that's it's really what, sometimes in the church, uh, we get controversial that if, you've never, if this is your first time in church, sorry, it's, it gets controversial once in a time. And sometimes people will say, I read the Bible this way, and it's the only way to read the Bible, and if you disagree, you must not read the Bible or care about the Bible at all, care about God. So you're a heathen and fires of hell and all that good stuff, right? Or there's another possibility. Maybe the possibility is that the Spirit is telling us something deeper about the very word God has given us. Maybe Jesus is actually telling us the truth, that faith is not about believing one interpretation of the Bible or not, but maybe faith is about hearing and telling new stories about the same word. Either way, uh, it gets specific. After Jesus says that, he gets specific and says, what do you think about murder? I'm against it. Or what do you think about punishment for murder? Yeah, yeah, that sounds sounds pretty good. What do you think about capital punishment? Careful, because remember, Jesus is the guy who... Uh, died on a cross when the state executed him. So that gets a little tricky. Uh, So many people think that God wants to punish people as much as they want to punish people. So many folks think that that God uh, is as much into revenge as they are. And in fact, there are those stories in the Bible written by people who are so much into revenge that they apply that to God. But Jesus says it doesn't matter whether it's Murder, or calling someone an idiot, which is, I like that translation. The Aramaic is raka. That's the, that was their way to say, uh, you fool, raka. It doesn't matter if it's murder or any kind of hostility that we have in our heart. An angry heart is what is detestable to God. And what God wants instead is reconciliation. It is forgiveness. And notice Jesus doesn't fall into the trap. He never falls into the trap of the political divides of his time or our time. He doesn't vote for radical mercy for people who deserve punishment. And he doesn't vote for sending people to hell with the slightest mistakes. We tend to think we have to choose between those um, sound bites. But Jesus says there is a deeper issue that God wants to get at. And that is how to change our hearts more peacefully. You have heard the commandment that says... You must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You have heard the law that says, a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. 
But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. wasn't controversial already. It got awkward now. Adultery and divorce. Um, I propose we get right to the divorce thing because I think you can do the math uh, with the whole adultery in the heart. I mean, maybe there's a sermon someday where we can really get to that and talk about sexism and pornography and physical adultery, but also the, the dangers of, uh, of disrespecting the person you love by flirting with someone else. But, but I think you can do that. Uh, so sometimes when people hear the word divorce in church, they cringe. Uh, you might throw the Bible at me because you know, that's, that's not PC. We all know that in America, more than 50% of marriages end in divorce. Second marriages, two-thirds of them end in divorce. Third marriages, three-fourths of them end in divorce. Many of you have been through a divorce or three uh, in this church. My parents combined had eight divorces. Yeah, I win. Uh, <laughs> So if anyone wants to throw stones about divorce, even if Jesus wants to throw stones, it shouldn't be in this room, in this country. Um, we, we know divorce. We know it. Anyone here not been touched by it in their life, in their parents' life, in the, someone in their family? It's around us. We know it. Uh, except in Jesus' day, it was actually a little different. It was actually more common. We don't have a way to uh, estimate percentages on that. Um, but today we have things that kind of hold us together. Financial considerations. What do we do with the children? Uh, we made a commitment. Who made a commitment in Jesus' day in a marriage? There wasn't any we at all. In the first century, there was no we. Divorce was the man's decision, just like marriage was the man's decision. He didn't need a compelling reason. All he had to do was write out a formal note, have it stamped. He was free, and she was out. That was it. In the first century, men chose to divorce women all the time. We have a record, uh, you know, we find all these old things in stone and papyrus and all, and some of them are, are, seem as boring as can be. If you think the part of the Bibles are boring, just, just read receipts from like 56 AD. That's pretty boring stuff. But in some of those we find there's a guy who brags about being divorced 40 times. That's like Elizabeth Taylor times five or something. Um, <laughs> And what do you think happened to these women after this divorce? Forty women, what happened to them? Uh, they didn't get the children because children were property and men got all the property. No split, men got all the property. Usually the women couldn't get jobs because in that day, family was a woman's job and a woman's job was family and that's where the conversation ended. Some of them could have gone back to their fathers, uh, but there was such a... You, maybe you, you grew up in a time when there was a big stain of unworthiness on divorce. You don't even understand what it was then, the stain of unworthiness. So usually the family even said, no, 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 you should have made your husband happy. Go back. So what did most of the cast-off women do to stay alive? They begged or they sold their bodies. That was their choice. And to that system, Jesus says, you know the law. You know the customs you're used to. But men, if you send a woman away just because you're tired of her, you are the victimizer. And God is always on the side of the victim. Actually, the first time that Jesus taught this kind of message, really early in his ministry, and a lot of people were starting to follow him. Let's imagine it's about as many people in this room were following Jesus. And he said something very similar uh, and there was this hushed awkwardness in the room. And so he just says, what are you all still doing uh, here? Because half the people left. More than half the people. Almost everybody left. He said, what are you all, what are, those of you, like your three pews right there, you stuck around. Everyone else left. And he said, what are you doing here? And so Peter, who always is the first one to, to, to speak, he said, well, that's a really hard teaching, but we don't have anywhere else to go. And so Jesus started off with 12 men, maybe the only 12 men in all of Israel, 
who could conceive that women deserved more rights than they were afforded. That's who the disciples were, the only men who could handle Jesus' harshest teaching about the system of divorce. And maybe that sounds reassuring in that context, but we live today. Let's bring it to the modern day, because divorce is one of those things that some people, it's just some religious people, maybe in this room, maybe in those rooms over there, uh, get so hung up with. So I have two questions for you about divorce today. First of all, does God hate divorce? I, I think God hates anything that breaks God's people. I think God hates anything that hurts us. I think the Bible is clear for our context and for theirs that God hates it when we suffer. So maybe so. Second question, uh, does God hate divorce more than God loves you? No, absolutely not. There is nowhere that God ever says God will give up on us, even if we give up on marriage or whatever it is. But all over the Bible, God says the hurting and the broken and the lost are welcomed here. So even if God hates divorce, and even if you're going through some hard things in your marriage, which if you are, I'm here to chat with you and try to help you through a way of that, but uh, God loves you more. Whether you're married or single or widowed or divorced or polyamorous or asexual or whatever you are, God loves you more than God hates anything. Amen? Amen. Okay, Wes, you're going to read a couple more verses, and we'll sing the last verse of our hymn. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of the Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. I hear people uh, quoted or misquoted all the time. They say, doesn't the Bible say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Shouldn't we just punish the criminals and bomb that country and make them pay? And Might as well shoot them before they take our eyes out. And I have to say it with a cartoonish voice because it always comes from some angry, maladjusted cretin who's happy to misuse God's word to justify whatever evil seems to float through their hearts at the time. Doesn't the Bible say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Yes, it does. The Bible says that. But Jesus says about as clearly as any barbecue stain on that person's shirt... That God doesn't work that way. What, barbecue? We don't like barbecue around here? God doesn't work that way. People work that way. All the time. About revenge. God works differently. Like, doesn't the Bible say we should just let people slap us around? Isn't that the next thing in there? Slap us around, turn your cheek, something like that? Um, shouldn't you just be weak and submissive? Isn't that what the Bible says? If it says that, I can't accept that. Um, If you think that's what the Bible says, you've missed the point of the passage that he was just reading. I did this once uh, with Mary Melander, one of our teenagers. I had her come up and slap me, uh, which we can try that again if uh, she wants another shot at it. Uh, First things first, in Middle Eastern culture, even today, the right hand is for handshakes, it's for writing, it's for eating, it's for slapping people. The left hand... Uh, what's the muscle for today? <laughs> it's for that. Okay, so if you touch me with your left hand in Middle Eastern culture, it's shameful to you. Okay, so no one's going to slap you with the left hand. Can't be done. It is a cultural taboo. Doesn't matter how angry you are or anything. You're not going to hit someone with the left hand. So you got, you got your right hand. Um, Amy, you want to be? Anastasia will slap me. Okay, Sam, Sam. With your right hand, slap. Make it a good one. Give it a whack. Slap me again. Imagine Samuel L. Jackson doing that. Slap me again. No. When she has to, if I was to try to do it with your right hand. Exactly. Yeah. 
Exactly. <laughs> you can't slap me. You can, I have disarmed you by turning and looking at you. I have neutralized your anger. I've shown you my humanity. I've shown you maybe that you've hurt me. Now, I'm not saying, and Jesus isn't saying, that every situation out there are you to just turn your other cheek and try to disarm the situation. There are things in our lives where we are supposed to run. There are things in our lives where maybe we're supposed to fight, but God can work always for a third option. Finally, you've heard that sermons go on forever, but we're getting to the end. Uh, You've heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you there's a better way. It might be hard, but there's a better way to pray for your enemies. You've heard it said that God helps those who help themselves. You've heard it said that God loves those who follow the rules and sends the others to hell. You've heard it said that the only way to get to heaven is to believe all the right stuff. But Jesus said God loves those who need help. But Jesus said we are all going to fall short of perfection and the deepest rule in God's book is grace. But Jesus said God sent me into this world to offer abundant life to all. You've heard it said that God is in the business of deal-making, like some spiritual loan shark. If you do this, God will do that. If you don't do this, God will do that. But Jesus said there is a new deal. There is a new promise. One day, Jesus was having dinner with his very best friends, people who he had taught. Most of them were still stuck in their own understandings of their uh, culture and their understanding of God. He sat around a table with them one final time. And he said something like this. You have heard it said that your body must be pure, that you must be whole if you're going to have any connection with God whatsoever. But I tell you that this is my body, broken for you. Anytime you eat of it, I want you to remember Brokenness can be healed. And he took the cup. You may think, you may have heard that the way to get right with God is through certain prayers and rituals. But I tell you, my life is poured out for you. So that whenever you drink of this cup, you need not wallow in guilt, but understand that God has taken down sin and given a path forward for all. It might be hard, it might be unexpected, but God's grace is so overwhelming and moves us toward a future of hope. You've heard it said that the Lord has died, but I tell you that as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim new life that comes again. It's our custom to have two lines come through the center aisle to rip off a healthy chunk of bread, dip it in the juice, and uh, have a prayer with our God as we listen to some music. So I'd invite our servers forward. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to come to your table.